Good afternoon. Hello, all of you. Uh, that was such an emphatic welcome that the people next door applauded it, which is good. Uh, welcome to the Sydney Writers' Festival session. My name is Michael Williams. I'm the director of the Wheeler Centre, and I'm thrilled to be here for this afternoon's iconic duos session. There's a bit of stuff to explain about who we are, why we're here, what iconic duos means. But you're all here anyway, which is a pretty good sign. It suggests that some of the explaining has been done already. But I can say that on this stage, amongst the seven people here, are six people with the most incredible talent as writers uh, that you're going to see in any session at this festival. And just a spoiler alert, I'm not one of the six, in case you are confused. Uh, I am very excited to have these writers here. Before I go any further, I would say we are visitors not just to this festival, but to this country. Uh, this is the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people, their elders past and present, and the elders and members of theirs and other communities that are with us today. We acknowledge country in part to acknowledge that the moral and legal implication of invasion remains unresolved to this day. Um, it's also funny that the Writers' Festival takes as its theme this year, Lie to Me. And uh, uh, there's a kind of interest running through all the sessions about the ways in which writers uh, construct the world for us and make up stories. And there's no more acute lie uh, in Australia than the lie of country, uh, whether it's the lie of Terra Nullius or uh, the lie that we're somehow in any way reconciled. Uh, it's worth us stopping and reflecting on this as we go into this and any session this week. So, how many of you have heard of the Wheeler Centre? That's pretty good. I can go home. Uh, th that is fantastic news. We're here today because uh, the Wheeler Centre is doing a scheme that we're very proud of, that we're... Uh, officially, as of today, launching year two of. It's called The Next Chapter, and it's what brings these six extraordinary writers together. And it feels like a good place to talk about it, because in a way, a writer's festival is, uh, is supposed to be not just a chance to hear from the iconic single writers and duos that you may already have heard of, but a chance to discover new writers, and a chance for writers to sit in the audience and hear from their peers, hear from potential mentors. So. We wanted to use the opportunity of the festival to talk a bit about what the next chapter is doing and to hear from these amazing writers who are mentors and mentees within the scheme. So if you will uh, indulge me for a minute, I am going to explain the kind of parameters of what we're trying to do with the next chapter. And then uh, two by two, we'll chat with each of these pairs of writers to hear about their experience of mentoring and being menteed. I hate the word mentee. It feels so close to manatee. And, um, and they're creepy. I mean, really, you see a picture of them, they're like cows of the sea, manatees. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, the Wheeler Centre's been going for almost 10 years now, and we were set up by the State Government of Victoria with a brief to um, celebrate and promote books, writing and ideas, uh, both in Melbourne, but also more widely in Australia, to kind of build a community around uh, around that art form. And that's a kind of particularly abstract concept. That's one of those things government like doing is setting up new centres with complicated names. But what we discovered very quickly was there was already this incredible and rich community of writers who are working together in a range of different ways. Um, too often I think we think about writers only in terms of their commercial and publishing output, whether we've seen them in the front shelf of the bookshop or in the big W or in, in the airport or whatever it is. And Thinking about the craft of writing, the development of writing became a really important thing for the Wheeler Centre. We wanted to make sure that beyond putting on public talks and introducing those writers to audiences in that way, we wanted to find ways to have that relationship uh, between the writing and the craft of it be something that we were involved with. Uh, and so we built the next chapter as a scheme. We launched it last year, and the idea behind it is in a way, fairly straightforward. We select 10 writers each year, and what we try and do is kind of stage an intervention, because let's face it, writers need an intervention. Um, the nature of this, though, was to help them at the early stage of their career, help them at the point at which they were honing their craft and finding their voice, but were perhaps not ready to be put into the sausage machine that is uh, kind of trade publishing. Because 
we feel that there's a danger in this country that publishing is inherently conservative, inherently risk averse. That because very few people make money out of books, whether it's the booksellers or the publishers or the writers themselves, it's very, uh, very hard to make a living out of it. It can become the domain of the privileged. Publishers can veer towards the people who write in a style that they think is a sure thing for the bestseller lists. They, uh, they don't take chances, and so they don't encourage true creativity. True creativity is not rewarded by market forces. So if you're lucky enough to run a not-for-profit with high-minded ideals like the Wheeler Center, it seems to us it's our responsibility to find ways to take that moment of developing as a writer and remove it from the market, remove it from those markers of success and failure that make it perilously difficult and make people round off the corners of the individuality and the creativity that makes them amazing writers in the first place. So we consulted really widely. We talked to writers and teachers of writing. We talked to uh, people who ran community organisations and we talked to other arts organisations to work out what the best way we could stage this intervention might be. And what we hit upon was that writers needed money, they needed time, and they needed people to talk to through the process. So the recipients of the next chapter get $15,000 and they get assigned a mentor. And what we ask of them uh, at the point at which they join the scheme is that they slow things down for a bit. For the first year uh, of their involvement with the scheme, rather than selling their undoubtedly brilliant manuscripts to the highest bidder and the first publisher that came along, we want them to use that time and take that time to work out what their voice is, what their markers of success and failure are, to work out the ways in which their unique identity as a writer can be something that makes them stronger rather than makes them a liability when it comes to working out how they can get into the discount chains. We were inundated with applications. We uh, prepared ourselves for the possibility of about maybe 500 tops. Uh, we got 1,100. Um, there was some weeping in the Wheeler Centre offices that day. Um, uh, but it was so gratifying and so exciting. It was the first time we'd uh, done anything on a national scale. And what we got was people who really wanted to find their voice. They wanted to find a chance to kind of work and be able to stand up and say, I am a writer, something that was a leap that for many of them uh, they hadn't made before. We're also very clear that one of the intentions of the scheme was we wanted writers who one way or the other might have been let down or might potentially expect to be let down by conventional publishing and trade publishing. Marginalised voices, voices from underrepresented communities, people who were telling stories that might not be uh, might not be thought by uh, kind of the levers of mainstream publishing to be conventionally commercial as prospects. We're not so interested in the commercial. I mean, obviously, the uh, three writers you're going to hear from tonight who are part of the scheme are all going to be bestsellers. They're all going to win kind of big prizes and lucrative kind of adaptation deals with Netflix and all of that. But that's not the aim of the game. The aim of the game is to find ways for them to be true to their own voices, true to the stories that they want to tell. So the second part of it was assigning mentors, and that's what we're going to uh, hear a bit about today and discuss today, because what we felt was that writing in isolation was a much harder way to do it, and if we could attract the right uh, group of established writers to work with our 10 recipients, then that would give them a much richer experience across the year. I could bang on, uh, in case you hadn't already worked that out, but I am going to now throw to our iconic duos. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move through each of the three pairs on the stage, and we're going to hear a little bit about what that mentoring experience has been like, what the expectations were, and really what that process of giving and taking criticism as an emerging and developing writer uh, is like, and how that works. And we're going to start right down the far end there, Tony Birch's fidgeting in his chair because he senses he's about to be named, brought to the microphone. Tony is the first of our mentors uh, to introduce today. He's the author of Shadow Boxing, Father's Day, Blood, The Promise, Ghost River, and Common People. He has a new book that is coming out in June called The White Girl, uh, and he is an extraordinary writer, and we were thrilled uh, when he agreed to be one of our mentors. Please welcome Tony Birch. You've, you've set a precedent now. Everyone's going to have to do that. That's upsetting. 
Um, Evelyn Araluen is a poet, educator and researcher working with Indigenous literatures at the University of Sydney. Her work has won the Nakata Brophy Prize for Young Indigenous Writers, the Judith Wright Poetry Prize and the Next Chapter Fellowship. She was born, raised and writing in Darug country. She's a Bundjalung descendant. Please make her very welcome. <laughs> Tony, I'm going to start with you and ask you whether you have or have had mentors as a writer yourself? No, um, not specifically as a writer, but I think one of the things that I think is important to me to be there for Evelyn is that I, I went back to education as an adult, so I went to night school to do my year 12 when I was 30, and then I went on to university. And what I would say is I had mentors in the form of teachers, both at year 12 and at university, who really shifted my level of confidence. So most of my writing, I haven't had that one-on-one -on -one relationship, so I didn't do, say, for instance, a, a PhD in creative writing. But what was important to me, and what I would say is great mentorship, is that I found people who actually believed that I had value and talent, and with that, I, was, I felt much more confident about what I wanted to do. And one of my roles, I think, with Evelyn is that, you know, I, I taught creative writing for 15 years and I've supervised PhDs, but that's a very formal relationship with Evelyn and I. And, and seriously, mentoring a young Aboriginal woman is, say, there's also, for me, a community cultural, a level of pastoral care that I would take very seriously because there are a lot of expectations on young Aboriginal women. And my role is to, to guide where I can guide and to keep it a bit of a distance as well because you don't want to stifle the energy of that young voice. So I actually do see my role as similar to the support that I got in to say to everyone, you can do this, yeah. as simplistic as that sounds, rather than just be there as a technical advisor. I want to jump straight to asking you, Evelyn, whether Tony effectively does that, but that seems <laughs> a little mean. So I, I, I'm going to instead first ask you, when, so the way the process went is after the 10 recipients were successful, uh, it was a kind of iterative conversational process to work out the best mentors for each of you. What did you at a gut level want from a mentor going in? I mean, the first thing, and you might get this vibe um, that Tony's very well equipped to this, um, I, I think that I needed someone to kick me in the ass and just sort of be like, okay, you can't fuck around, oh, sorry. I told her not to swear. I don't follow You're not a very advice. good mentor. <laughs> um, I, I think for me it was not simply looking for somebody who writes poetry that I love and poetry that I admire. Um, it was also understanding that there is work that I want to produce which has um, a cultural element to it and in fact is grounded in culture. Um, you know, work that I also wanted to, to understand... Uh, in terms of my own identity and interests and responsibilities. But also, you know, like I'm coming from a space where, unlike Tony, you know, I went straight from high school and into university and I, I somehow haven't managed to leave university yet. And so I negotiate in addition to the creative space and, and academic space that Tony's got a lot of experience in. And while I was looking for somebody who's, who wrote poetry that I loved and somebody who was preferably coming from a cultural background as well um, and also, you know, hopefully someone who's had some experience with publishers and had experiences with the industry, I did also really want help with negotiating what it is to be in some ways affiliated with educational institutions and how, you know, I wanted to learn how to produce work which was holding those institutions to account and Tony's really good at that. So that for me, you know, in addition to yet the confidence and the motivation and the experience bringing to that, you know, I, I, I wasn't interested in being taught how to be complacent within these systems and these structures. I didn't want anyone to console me, you know, oh, these are some of the issues that you're going to encounter, but don't worry, it's fine, just ignore them. Everyone goes through it. It's just the nature of the industry. Someone who's critical of that, you know, that to me is, is as valuable as the poetry and the craft and the education I can receive around that. That's really interesting because it seems to me that um, 
you know, part of your background before going into the scheme was about supporting other writers and developing their work. And so the perhaps, and I don't want to be presumptuous here, one of the pressures for you in the scheme is prioritising your own work. And when you work within academia, that can be so channeled through expectations and requirements of others. How do you carve out that space and say, no, it's time for me to be selfish for my own writing? Um, badly. Um, it, it is, it's so hard to get the space to learn and the, and the actual space to recognise that just because I... I started going into academia and higher education very, very, very early on. I still have a lot to learn and I still have a right to learn that. Um, when you're in a space where you're a, you're a marginalised voice attempting to speak to an issue that, you know, is structural um, and is, is um, endemic to a lot of these different institutions you face a lot of um, really patronising behaviour and it's hard to take a position against that without just allowing yourself to become sublimated into that, without just sort of going like, oh, okay, you want to patronise me, you don't want to give me space, that's fine, I'll just wait my turn. And in, in this scheme, I think it was so refreshing to actually get the opportunity to put my hand up and go, hey, you know, I never actually learned how to write poems. Like, do you guys, you you realise that, like, I don't really know what I'm doing? I I feel working in Aboriginal literature and working in an area where there's a lot of under-recognition and there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of complacency, I am very interested in trying to make the space better for those who are yet to come and also for those who did come and were forgotten and were, were left behind in that process. But, um... You don't want to be selfish and say like I, I just want I want this to fit me. I want I want this to be a space for me now. But when you have a mentor, you're allowed to let them say that, and you don't feel narcissistic because they're the ones saying no, no, no. You can take advantage of this. No, you can learn from this. So giving up a little bit of that um, responsibility is really nice. I think Tony, before you were saying that like I'm reminding you of your daughters because I'm just coming to you being like fix this. Fix my problems. It's your responsibility now. And I, I'm very happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. See, that seems like a symbiotic relationship there. That's perfect. That's... It does. I mean, it, it is interesting because, again, I, I, think, I think some mentor-mentee-ish relationships wouldn't have this component, but the, the cultural specificity of this is and for other people I think is really important so when I jokingly said to Evelyn in the way I, yeah, I've got four adult daughters I've now adopted a fifth one partly it's a joke but for me the greatest challenge is one is I actually see my working with Evelyn as a really strict responsibility that as with other young Aboriginal women, my four daughters, I have a really strict responsibility to do give the best advice, support I can. The trick is, or for me is, the balance is, and I wouldn't say this, say to a student, I take on a what might seem like a paternalistic role, which could be sound unhealthy, you know, an older male working with a younger woman and stifling that woman's voice. But in the context of our community, we both know where that balance is because the other trick to that is that with young Aboriginal women, the last thing you want to do in any way is to stifle their creativity, their anger, their passion. So you've got to, you've got to give a quite wide arc to that. So I sort of prefer to stand back in regard to the poetry and just work with that technically and to say, well, the guidance I am going to give should never inhibit you from questioning that or for ensuring that your voice is is strong. So I like that because I actually I see it as a a, a responsibility that I really enjoy and that I feel honoured to take on that responsibility. It's, it's a real privilege. That's, that's really important and it seems to me to be a, an important part of the dynamic, I imagine, uh, with all of you. But I'm interested, Evelyn, you say you'd never learned to write poetry. Do you find yourself 
that relationship between wanting your own voice and wanting the traditions that you're fitting into, like, is that frustrating, that light touch, or do you, uh, does the confidence give you the space to go, there's no poetry that you can learn, you can just develop your own voice? Well, when I, when I first spoke to Tony, I think I was kind of like, I need you to teach me how to write poetry. I need you to give me the rules. And then Tony was like, I don't know them. And so <laughs> it felt a little bit as if, you know, as, as if you were kind of like playing a bit of a trick on me, being like, I'm going to withhold this. I know what's going on, but I'm going to withhold it and I'm going to let you work it out. And I was very much like, no, just tell me, please. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but it's actually been really generative. I, I think I always feel as a poet that, that everybody else knows how to write poetry and I just didn't go to class that day and that everybody's doing really interesting things and I'm just sort of sitting around being like, if I put a bunch of lines together and there's enjambment, is that a poem? Um, but I, I think reading, particularly reading Tony's work and learning from that form and learning from that innovation as opposed to just asking, please tell me what to do. You know, it's, it's as Tony's saying, like, you know, it's, it's giving me space to work things out myself um, and to also be motivated to try to push stylistic um, uh, boundaries, you know, when you don't know what's the right thing or the wrong thing, you're hopefully going to create something that's a little bit closer to home and a little bit closer to your own, own voice. So there might be times in which... I feel like I just want a bit of a, a cop out and I want somebody else to take authority over that. But I think Tony's got more patience and resilience in that than I have. So I know that I'm not going to be able to just give up and expect him to, to give me the secret list of, of poetic techniques that I've been waiting for this whole time. I'm, he's never going to give me that. I have to work that out myself. Frustrating, but I appreciate it, you know. I just want to add a bit of a, a, bit of a caveat because I don't want people to think I'm coming across as just a lazy doing nothing. He's, he's not. He's um, just holding the poetry secrets from me. No, what I would say is, and I, I, I taught poetry when I taught creative writing, but I'm more, I, I, it's, I'm, re, I'm a reader. I'm not a, mm. I'm not a great technician as a teacher, I, and I always said that. The point being, though, the... Despite what Evelyn says, the work is exceptionally good. The work is exceptionally, in my opinion, technically very original. And if I was thinking as a reader of poetry, which I am a good reader of poetry, mm -hmm. this is going to be a great book of poems. So if Evelyn was failing that, I wouldn't just sit back and say, oh, look, I'm your mm -hmm. uncle, so I'm not going to intervene mm -hmm. here. I'd say, Evelyn, this is not working. Mm. So I, I actually would say that. Mm. The reason why I feel confident to give her space is that I've read a lot of the work several times and it is really sh shit hot. It's high quality. So I don't have to do that. So I, I think it would be negligent of me or anyone here to think that I would let that go by. Because if, yeah, again, we're here representing the Wheeler Centre and one of the outcomes is we want these young people to... We want really high quality, dynamic, original work. So my job would be to say, if I thought that was a lapse or a failing in that, I'd be pointing it out very quickly. What I've been very confident of four months in, we're, we're going along very well. The work is coming in. It's great work. I can see a book. We're talking today. We talked about our next phase is to literally print out pages, put them on the floor, look at a layout of a book, change the themes around. So I'm at a level of what I'm saying is a high quality manuscript. I'm not at a level of saying, I don't know if she can write a poem yet. So I would hope people understand that. You know, this is, there's a real responsibility here as well to make sure you are producing good work. That, that's a really good and really valuable um, <laughs> clarification, Tony. And one of the, you're not lazy, you're mean. We get that now, that's a, that's a good thing. And no, it, it is an important thing that when you talk about a year's worth of creative or professional or artistic development, um, 
that's not a question of fixing work that's broken or, um, or turning people into something that they're not already at the start of the process. It's actually about recognising the limitations of the publishing system as it exists and trying to find ways to circumvent that but also arm the writers with what they need so that at the point at which they're facing uh, the publishing world, uh, uh, they're better equipped to do so. I will say that in the selection process, we had an amazing judging panel uh, of, uh, of uh, Christos Cholkas, Ben Law, Maxine Beniba clark and... Ellen. Ellen Van Niven. Excellent work, thank you. Just testing. Uh, th and the four of them independently uh, read a huge range and came back with their short lists. And there were very long, very detailed conversations about hundreds of the work. Uh, but it is worth noting that on their short lists, there were um, something like seven works that were common to all four sh short lists. And the, uh, the other three final recipients were all on three short lists. The standard of the final work that, uh, that got through was incredibly high and uh, incredibly exciting. Like, we have been energised at every point of this process, but possibly none more than uh, when confronted with the amazing writers. Uh, who we're proud to be shepherding through the scheme. I'm going to move to our next iconic duo, uh, but you will get a chance to ask questions uh, at the end of any of the people here. Michelle Lee, uh, the second of our mentors to be introduced on the stage, is an Asian-Australian playwright and theatre maker working across stage, live art and screen. Her work is largely narrative-focused in comedy and drama and explores stories of women, otherness and found families. Current works in development include Single Ladies, How Do I Let You Die, The Pussy Monologues, Squishy Taylor, Going Down the Web Series, and a commission for Monash University. Uh, the, oh, sorry, I'm about to lose battery. That's going to be annoying. Previous works include an assistance notes for a pandemic, Going Down, Rice, Off Centre, The Naked Self, and Talon Salon. And Rice won the uh, 2017 Queensland Premier's Drama Award the 2018 Victorian Premier's Literary Award, uh, the 2018 Australian Writers Guild. She's much awarded. Please welcome Michelle <laughs> Lee. <laughs> and the second of our next chapter recipients is Giselle Onyin Nguyen. She's a Melbourne-based Vietnamese-Australian writer, editor and bookseller, marketing and communications manager for the Feminist Writers Festival and an inaugural recipient of the next chapter. She wrote a fortnightly column for Daily Life from 2015 to 2017 and a monthly fiction column for Scum throughout 2017. She's been published in publications including Me Anjan, The Saturday Paper, Kill Your Darlings, Rookie and Frankie. Please make her very welcome. <laughs> I'm going to kick off with you, Michelle. And the same question about the role of mentors and mentoring in the development of your own work. Yeah. Um, I, well, we... With um, most of the plays that I've developed, there's generally I, I, I have someone on board who's like a script editor, a, a dramaturg. Um, so I, in terms of emotional support, kind of championing me, the playwright, my story, as well as the technical advice, um, I've been fortunate. Just the kind of setup of of theatre is that there usually is someone kind of in in my corner. Um, but I, just when when Tony mentioned teachers, I did think back to a high school drama teacher I, I had, because it was funny, the, 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 in year 11, the drama teacher said, in, essentially, she was Canadian, so she didn't say it like this, she said, don't, don't, don't bother, bother love, there's not going to be enough roles for Asian people. Um, and then the next year, I had Gary Fry, and you know, I was only 17, so I didn't really know actor, and you know, eventually becoming a playwright, and Gary just was very supportive of whatever it was that he could recognise that I didn't recognise in myself that was burgeoning. Um, and out of school, he uh, attached me to some kind of community theatre development programs that he was working on. And I look back on that, and as I said, like, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do, but Gary knew there was something in there, and he just nurtured it in whatever form um, it was at the time. Um, so, yeah, that was a lovely opportunity to just reflect and... He's still alive. I'm speaking about him as though he's not here. But um, I, had, I hadn't thought about Gary until that moment. And it was really nice to think about it in, in terms of someone who mentored me when I didn't even know I was being mentored. Giselle, what did you expect going in? What did you hope for out of the mentoring relationship? 
Uh, well, I have often referred to Michelle as the older, hotter version of me. Um, and what I wanted was somebody who shared a similar cultural background to me. So we don't have exactly the same cultural background. Um, but because I'm writing a manuscript about my family, there's some stuff that comes up that is quite um, delicate to handle. Um, and especially uh, because I know that Michelle and I have similar lifestyles, um, I just really needed someone who might help me navigate some of the trickier parts of sh sharing a story that can be, sometimes be personal and maybe sometimes also paint people that I love and really care about in not the best light. Um, so it's been really helpful to have those conversations about what, what I should include and what I should take out. Although at this, at this stage, I'm kind of just writing everything and I'll figure out what I need to take out later. But um, yeah, so I kind of, what I wanted was somebody that I could have those conversations with. Also someone to read my work quite closely because I, um, I have lots of friends who are happy to do that, but only to a point. Yeah. So, Do you, uh, of those friends who are readers for you, are there ones who, like, are you part of writing groups traditionally? Do you have people who have... Um, explicitly challenged you on your work or are they friends who give you supportive advice? It's a little bit of both to be honest like I don't I think it's flattering and nice if I send a friend something and they just reply and say it's good but I don't think that that's very helpful in challenging me to maybe interrogate some things deeper and stuff like that. I am part of a writing group um, but usually it's more just people that I can write with physically so I'm not so isolated um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do have friends who do read things really closely, but again, um, not many who have a similar cultural background to me, and that is a perspective that I really appreciate, so. It, uh, that's a really interesting question for me, and it actually applies to all of you. Uh, in terms of the extent to which, when we, when we first conceived of the scheme, in the early conversations, we talked about assigning an editor to work with each of the writers. Like One of the early conceptions was mm. uh, that there's a dearth of good editorial practice in our publishing houses and actually someone who was, would really get in on a line-by-line -line level and work with the writers was going to be more valuable. And we, we got lots of feedback and we workshopped it. And in the end, we decided that there are all kinds of ways you need support in that first year. But for lots of people, it won't be that kind of granular level, it'll be something else. Um, as you said, you're writing a manuscript which is autobiographical. Um, it's not theatre. It's not. Um, it was more important to you to have that shared cultural experience than to be writing in the same medium? Well, Michelle has written a book before, but um, what has been interesting actually to be working with somebody who writes plays is that, um, because obviously plays kind of throw you into a scene, um, a lot of Michelle's feedback has been like, can, can we go into this scene more or can we talk about things in an immediate way rather than me looking back now and being like, and now knowing all the things that I know, this is what that meant, you know? Mm. Um, and also there's been a lot of talk about exploring uh, grey areas and not going into things so black and white, which I often do do. Yeah. So I think, I mean, also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I define myself in, in terms of being a writer as I, I write plays um, and I think um, what that also means is because I have less experience with publishing in a way like I, I don't I don't care in a sense if if you write a manuscript at the end of this I know it's an, it's important to you and it, it's, a, it's a goal to, to work towards but I, I don't in a way I'm not burdened by that knowledge and that information I'm not kind of thinking in market terms or even in that that type of experience I guess I'm more concerned about where you are right now with this piece, wherever you are in your life, and in a more moment-by-moment moment way. And, Michael, when you mentioned the idea, the model of having an editor and a writer, I think what works about this is, as Tony said, there's more of a pastoral care. Like, I'm more interested in you as a person, your voice and your artist. And in a way, like, whatever you're generating is kind of a bit secondary to me, in a sense, even though it's a, it's a part of this program. Um, I, I'm not as fixated on on output and, and outcome, even though it helps guide our yeah. conversations that we have a point of focus, but that's not as important as just you developing your sense of, like, what does it mean to be a, a writer 
And what yeah. am I interested in? Yeah. And I mean, a lot of me and Michelle's conversations have just been about like my life and what is holding me back and stuff like that. Um, so she's like my mom, my actual mom's here, <laughs> but she's like my she's like the mum you never had. <laughs> but in, in fact, I, I, I feel if we kind of use the, the family analogy that these guys were talking about, I, I feel more like we're sisters, peers, because because of the age difference, and we're kind of in cross crossing generations a bit I and mean, in that sense too maybe the feelings that you might have sometimes of like it being an imposter like I I still share those as well so sometimes I'm feeling not being in a position of being an expert and being in a generation older I think sometimes perhaps that can kind of help you may not feel this but when I'm feeling terrified about some of the things you're talking about because I feel them too I'm hoping that I can you know tamp them down for myself and just kind of hold your hand a bit but like I yeah. like, totally get it as well yeah and I think like the other week I messaged Michelle and I was like oh my god I'm sorry that I'm so behind on sending this thing to you because I don't know what I'm doing and you were like oh it's okay I don't know what I'm doing either and I felt a lot better yeah because I think <laughs> I think he texted me and I was going through the same thing with with a piece of work that I was doing where I felt completely like a novice in in that work so you know in fact like it yeah the, the relationship is not like I I bear bear all this wisdom um it, it is, you know, it's, it's two-way. Like, when I look at um, Giselle and other uh, younger writers of colour, you know, in, in theatre as well, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. So, for me, you know, in just practical terms, I think these people are going to be employing me someday. So, I've, I've also got to build those relationships. Like, I certainly don't see it as though I hold all the answers. Did... Um Giselle, how's it changed your writing practice the past, whatever it is, four months, five months? It's been six, yeah. I know, I was just trying to be kind. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah, you're um, close. it's much further on. Well, I, um, I have published a lot, but most of the stuff that I've published has been media stuff, which has a very quick turnaround, so usually, and not much editing as well. So I might submit 800 words and it'll be online within an hour and no one's changed anything about what I wrote. So to be able to work on longer things, what I'm trying to do at the moment is just make kind of skeletons of the essays that will form the manuscript and kind of go back to them later and make them good. Um, but it is nice to be able to take my time um, and read really widely. Uh, and I think in the past, my work hasn't involved heaps of research. So that's a skill that I'm trying to develop at the moment as well. Um, but yeah, it's just a different mode. And I think um, the manuscript is something that I started working on very slowly a long time ago. And ever since this has started and having conversations with Michelle, it's really changed what I thought it was going to be, especially because as a reader, Michelle has told me what she finds interesting and what might be less interesting, which was different to how I had perceived it as well. So it's just good to know um, what what shape it's going to take and I think it's going to turn out to be pretty different to what I imagined, which is not a bad thing. Do you have particular goals you've set for yourself in the context of the scheme? Like, uh, somewhere you want it to go or are you happy to have it kind of a more exploratory process? Well, I mean, I think the, the main goal that I said was that I wanted to have a complete draft by the end of the year, but I've been saying that for the last three years. Um, but that is something that I'm quite serious about, and as we are at the halfway point now, I'm freaking out a little bit. But, I mean, but you've, you've got a roadmap. You've put together, um, you know, a document that says this is the aspirations of, like, what is going to fill those sixty to 80,000 words. Um, so it's not a complete, like, you know, step yeah. in the dark. But yeah, no, I think it's, um, the pressure is good for me because otherwise I would probably just languish. So, no, it's good pressure and, and Michelle's been really good too. Michelle's so. your writing personal trainer, kind of yes. shouting at you occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Saying, <laughs> really, that for breakfast <laughs> again? Yeah, no, it's the best More way to burpees. go. More burpees. I'm going to throw to our third iconic duo now, uh, Alison Whitaker, our mentor in question is a Gomorrah poet, essayist and legal scholar. She's a research fellow at the Jambana Institute. In 2017-2018, Alison was a Fulbright scholar at Harvard Law School, where she was named 
Dean Scholar in Race, Gender and Criminal Law. Her second book, Black Work, a collection of poetry, essays and short stories is out and she delivered for the Wheeler Centre last week, last week, uh, the F Word lecture uh, and it was phenomenal. It's up on the website, uh, you can watch the video of it or listen to the audio of it and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Please welcome Alison Whitaker. And Nayuka Gori is a Gunai Kunai Gunjamara Wiradjuri and Yorta Yorta writer. Nayuka writes social commentary and television comedy. Series three of Black Comedy was yours, and you're working oh, on series yeah. four at the moment. Yeah. Please welcome Nayuka Gori. All right, you've, you've got to see the other two pairs uh, go through it. Alison, have you been mentored? Are you currently being mentored? Yeah, I've always been mentored in informal ways, I think. Um, there's a tendency that when people have gone before you, you don't want to pull the ladder up behind you. So I've been mentored, um, I guess, in terms of my legal scholarship and a bit in my writing by Professor Larissa Barrent, who's, um, although our relationship is informal and now is of uh, employer and employee, which is a weird dynamic, um, it's been so enriching to have someone who can advise me on the things that are not just about career progression and not just about trying to figure out like, you know, what you want to do in terms of picking out a genre or picking out a technique, but actually seriously thinking about the responsibility that your work has, which when you're a young writer is so important because there's lots of, um, there's lots of people, publishers especially, who are willing to, to use a horrible phrase, like piss in your pocket, who are willing to say anything they can to get you um, and to make it kind of all about ego and individual drive. And I think to some extent I've been sheltered by that because of people who've been willing to pull me up on what's appropriate at what stage and what's not. Um, I've also benefited from the mentorship of Ellen Van Nierven through the Black and Right Project, through the State Library of Queensland, um, and also people in my family who, you know, from a very young age have um, given me a sense of... Uh, renewed self-image, um, and again, that relationship of responsibility. It's everywhere. It's not just people who are confined to your discipline. I think it's a more holistic framework. Nayuka, you... What did you want out of a mentor when you started in the scheme? Um, someone to deal with my self-loathing? No, actually, though. Um, I think... So what I initially asked for... Um, it's funny, so Sophie, uh, Sophie was one of the people, Sophie Black, is that her last, um, that kind of helped things in the background, um, she's on mat leave now, isn't she? Yeah, how exciting. She's going to pop any minute, she's sad not to be here. Holy shit, cool, that's exciting. She's 14 months pregnant. Um, excellent. Um, so something I, I knew who I wanted, when they said, uh, you know, there's going to be a mentor. I, was, I, I knew immediately who I wanted and I said, I want Alison Whitaker. And Sophie was like, oh, well, we'll see if, you know, we can make that happen. I'm like, no, it's going to happen. I'm going to make it happen. Um, and I guess personally in Alice, like I knew I wanted Alison for a number of reasons. It's funny. I think when we think of a mentor relationship, we think of someone who's going to be older or much older than you, but Alison's younger than me. Um, so... Like, it's, that's kind of, I don't know, that's kind of cool. Um, but from Alison, I, the reason why I wanted Alison was because, like, I think the way that she looks at the world is a way that I, like, lenses that I apply to the world. So I knew I wasn't going to be some, like, fucking weirdo, um, which I think is good. Um, like, someone who sees you for who you are. Um, so that was really important. Uh, having a black fella... Um, was also really important because I know that once I go to the publishing, you know, once they, yeah, that stuff, um, I feel like right now is a stage where it can be as big or as expansive and as, like, you know, politically whatever. It can, be, it can do that right now and then as we go through the editing phase and commercial phase, then it can... It, like, it, I, I know that there'll be some reining in. That's just the nature of it, probably. But right now, I, know, I knew Alison or a mentor. I just wanted someone who would let me be as big as possible and, like, particularly having another queer black fella, mm -hmm. someone who thinks with an abolitionist kind of um, framework, that was also really important as well. Um, yeah. And someone I admire as well, I think, 
yeah, I really... It's weird to talk about Alison while she's right here, but... Sorry. Um, yeah, just someone who is doing the sort of things that I want to do eventually. Or, yeah, so that's what I wanted. And also, particularly, wanted someone who would recommend good books to read. Because I think that was... I hadn't ever learned how to write. Kind of like Evie, I like, hadn't learned. So I needed, yeah, kind of bibliotherapy as well. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm really interested in that idea of it being important, and you've all touched on this in different ways, important to admire the work of the person who's your mentor. That uh, That's not to prejudge how challenged you want to be by them or whatever, but that basis for respect has to be based around the work. How much for you is it about seeing the stuff you're writing as fitting into a tradition and how much of it is about trying to carve out your own new territory and needing someone who's going to be open to that? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I don't... I think up until this year I didn't really take... Like, if I'm honest, I didn't really take my writing very seriously. I think, like, I saw... I think I approached writing in a very, like, hand-to-mouth fashion. Something shit happened, so I'd write about it because I needed a place to put my feelings. Um, but I think doing this, it's like I'm actually thinking, like, oh, no, what kind of work do I want to create? Like, if I, can, if I can do anything in the world, what can I do? And so, like, I, this year, I think this kind of... This prompted it, but I've gone back and I'm studying creative writing at uni at the moment and that's I think that alongside being mentored is like I actually because I don't I don't know if this will attract much of a readership in current generations but I like I I, Eve and I were talking about it um, when we had our residency like I I feel like what I'm doing is hopefully creating some kind of archive that people will maybe pick up the way that I've picked up Audre Lorde or I'm obviously not like Audre Lorde. Um, I can only dream to be. But, yeah, inspire or, like, maybe there'll be a fucking little queer weirdo in, like, 20 years' time who'll find it and there'll be this niche 10 black people who read it and that's so fine. Um, But if that... I don't know if that'll be, like, any kind of traditional form or... I I don't know what it'll look like. But... There is a tradition of awesome black writing in this country, so mm. it's not like it's not like there isn't already some kind of canon or yeah, I don't know. Did that make sense? That well, was a lot yeah. of words. No, no, it really did. I'm Alison. For you, that idea of um, that idea of the canon and the reading list and the the kind of providing a, a framework and a basis. Are there things that you try to give to your mentorship with Nayuka that you wish you'd had when you were starting out as a writer? Like, are you actively, like, plugging gaps that you remember? Yeah, of course. I mean, I just... One thing I wish I had when I was kind of beginning to write was someone to egg me on and to see the paths of potential. I think... um, I hope you'll forgive me for saying this, but one of the the tricky things about writing within this... um, Mentorship has been trying to figure out what's um, what what's productive and what's not, what's worth having caution on and what's not, um, and just having that kind of um, close space and intimacy to be bold and make mistakes, and in making mistakes, potentially leaving open um, something really exciting and new that might not have otherwise been thought of because you were too shame or whatever. Um, I think that's probably been the thing that's excited me most about seeing where your work is going is um, that it's. Uh, bold, that it's at the moment um, unfinished, but we can explore ways that it can kind of snake out together. Um, And I'd never kind of seen someone else engage with work in that way before. Uh, I hope it feels like kind of we're we're walking together in this process, but I definitely feel like it's a mutual relationship. When you're talking about um, admiration earlier, I think one of the first times we met was at Sydney Writers' Festival 2017. And we're on this panel where we just mutually gushed. Yeah, we all just mutually gushed about each other's work and um, for the first time felt that feeling that you say that you want to feel about um, someone else picking up your work in 10 years' time. I felt like, damn, I'm a queer weirdo and here's another queer weirdo. And we're just kind of getting one another and it's, it's messy and it's got slippage, but it's there and it's really, um, I don't know, nurturing. 
one of the things that was an interesting learning for us at the Wheeler Centre was when we are announcing the intake of the first 10, there's this natural impulse, even though we were trying not to fit things into boxes, there's a natural impulse when you're talking to funders or you're talking to other people of, okay, so this person's writing poetry or this person's writing, uh, you know, non-fiction or this is, uh, that it was best to put it in terms that could easily be understood by where it fit in the kind of publishing landscape. And one of the things uh, that was exciting about your work, Nayuka, was we'd seen, <coughs> and the judges had seen your journalism, they'd seen your comedy writing, and you, and you're not alone in this, I think Giselle, it's true of as well, I think Evelyn's work uh, sits outside kind of uh, generic expectations about what a poetry collection would be. It was kind of anti-generic uh, in its way. It was that there were ideas that you wanted to get across, there were ways that you wanted to engage with the world, um, and that came ahead of predetermining what kind of book it was going to be. How important, or if it was going to be a book, how important is maintaining that freedom through this process versus turning it, as you say, as part of the narrowing it down, turning it into something that can then be a next step? Um, I think right now it's weird because I can't untangle this from going to uni and so it's hard to know. Yeah, I feel like I kind of... It feels like it's just potential. Like, when I had first put it in, it was just pure potential. And now it's like you have to really think about what it's going to be or whatever. I still I want to maintain that freedom. Um, but now that I'm also learning, it kind of... Part of me kind of hates what I'd written. But then I'm like, oh, that's... I don't know. I haven't answered your question. But I think freedom is really important um, because all the, all the other bits can happen later. Like... Someone's going to come through with a red marker. But right now, I just um, need to be, like, propelled forward. And I think the other thing is, like, actually fight, just do it and show someone your work. I think a big... I don't know if anyone else feels this, but, like, if you're used to being edited, particularly if it's online sh stuff, you're naked with one person and then it goes out. But, like, it feels like being naked with another person before being naked with another person. So it's, like, this weird vulnerability and like I just respect Alison so much that I'm yeah afraid to get naked I don't know <laughs> I this metaphor is excellent uh, I do need to clarify for people considering entering the next chapter for next year you don't have to get literally naked um, it's important that I just make that clear it's a metaphor but just in case I don't want to scare anyone yeah. I I um I think that's really terrific and I think we might throw it open to the floor um, because I think that idea of the ways in which you are uh, made bare going into the writing process, whether it's submitting uh, an entry for a scheme or whether it's sharing a piece of work with a friend or formally finding yourself a mentor, I think is a good kind of note to take us through on. There are, I think there's a microphone for audience questions that is coming up from the back. So if you put your hand up, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a little sound issue in this room. Uh, so it would be good if you waited until the microphone came to you and that way we will all hear you and you shouldn't be scared. Or maybe you should, I don't know. Oh, there's a question. We have one. Um, what processes do you go through, and this is for the entire panel, to get past writer's block? So the question uh, for anyone who uh, couldn't hear was around uh, the processes for any other panel for getting past writer's block. Um, go to the movies or go to a photographic exhibition? I think Michelle has often told me that I need to maybe go do some other work if I'm feeling stuck with the current work. So I'm currently doing a very boring copywriting project, so that has taken up time, and then when I'm not doing that, then I might feel inspired to write something that I actually care about. Um, yeah. But alternatively, I've also said, yeah, you've got to give yourself the time and just do it. Yes. And stay at the computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, I think just maybe um, summing up the, the courage to write absolute crap, even if it's just gibberish, to get it on the page. Um, and if that fails, just turn the brightness on whatever you're writing on all the way down and don't look at what you're writing until you've, you know, at least smashed out 10 minutes or so. One of the things that I was trying to do this year and have failed to do was to write at least 300 words a day. Um, I'm trying to get back on that, but even if they were bad words, then I would know at least there was something and I might be able to pick something good out of it. Oh, and just another thing I sometimes do is when I don't know what, in my case, the scene is, sometimes I just write about the writing so that I'm doing something. Like, I think I want her to walk into the room and I know this is the colour of her hair, this is what's happening in the day. So I just feel like I'm circling around the thing um, and it will eventually inform and propel me to write the thing, to write about the thing to start with? Um, think, yeah, actually, like, living, like, going out and experiencing the world, like, yeah, being a part of life, because I think that kind of helps keep things ticking over and actually experiencing things. Um, and also, sometimes writing drunk can be useful if, you know, if it's not a problematic thing for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and just like, yeah, be shit. Like, it's not going to be good. That's like, unless you, you know, sometimes it is, but like, it's not, it's okay to be a bit shit at first and then just keep going. And then, you know, that's the marble from which you do the other stuff or whatever. Yeah. Uh, do any of you think you're good judges of your own work? Like that question about letting yourself be shit. No, I'm a terrible judge of my own work. I think it's all shit mm. and everyone's made a horrendous mistake and it's going to be revealed soon. I think what helps me is to come back to it later and not reread it straight away. So there's stuff that I've sent to Michelle that I haven't touched again and I probably won't for a few months. Mm. So I have space away from it and then can come back to it and look at it with fresher eyes so I don't feel so attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I taught creative writing, I actually did say to students, it's really good to know when you're writing well, to learn that. Mm. Because if you just think it's bad, it's, that negative is, is problematic. But learning to know when you work well, you start to recognise the bad writing before it gets to the screen or in your notebook. So now that I'm writing well occasionally, I know my bad habits and terrible tics and they make it to the, the screen far less because you know what a good sentence looks like. And if you've written something well, and not to be an egomaniac, and this, Evelyn, this is what she hasn't learned, so I'm a bad mentor, is to say, this is good writing, I enjoyed this writing, I'm happy with it. And that satisfaction is not egotistical, it's, it's motivational. But what if you hate yourself, Tony? <laughs> what if you just hate yourself? Well, Gavin? <laughs> well, they should employ a psychologist for that, not a mentor. We do. I That's the next phase. We're now ready to announce that uh, there's quite a bit of therapy in year two. So good luck. I, I want to just jump and just jumping into that and just kind of like reflecting on on sort of you know the role of a mentor in that. I think I think like what's fantastic about the relationship that I have with Tony is that like, and this is what you want from a good mentor. Like they know what you need. And they're not just going to give you what you want. And so, you know, like me demanding like, no, 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 I'm anxious and I hate myself. I need you to tell me that my work's bad so I can rewrite it and then tell me how to rewrite it. And then that, that sort of thing of like step outside of yourself. Someone else is responsible for this now. They can be the ones pulling that in and making you, you, you change that lens. Um, and for someone like me, I need that. Maybe not everybody else needs that, but that's something that, that has at least made me sort of go, okay, what I have is not... I don't need to throw it away. And I, in terms of, like, writer's block, I have no actual advice for that, but I don't delete anything. I just gradually shift it down lower and lower into a page, like some sort of purgatory. Maybe I'll go back there and revisit it one day if I'm really desperate, but just keep on blank paging until that's, that's just somewhere far away. I deleted 10,000 words. Why? <laughs> because... Did. I hated it, and now I'm, I still, I think I still have it, like it's in some other file path somewhere in the ether, like, and then I caught up with Alison last week, and I was like, Alison, I deleted 10,000 words, and I gave these other words, Alison's like, why? 
And now I'm like, oh, that was stupid. But anyway, that's a better idea. It, but, I mean, there's no room for shame here. That's an understandable part of the process, I think. Um, yeah, allowed to admit that vulnerability and we'll work through it. It is genuinely one of the core things that we hope the next chapter can achieve is actually helping the recipients be good advocates for their own work, you know, whether it's about finding the confidence to see when it's good or everything else. I think one of the real dangers in publishing is we have many very good publishers in this country who are very good at identifying potential. And so a, um, a manuscript half as talented as any of the samples that we saw from the writers who are in the next chapter scheme will get offers, and it'll get offers fast. And um, the problem is that doesn't mean the publisher's the right publisher for it. It doesn't mean they have the capacity or the resources or the wherewithal to turn it into the piece of work that it should be. It just means they've spotted the potential. And the real danger there is if you're not confident and if you're not confident and you're not a good advocate for your work, then you let yourself get on the conveyor belt. You let the publisher tell you how it should be marketed, what the cover should be, how you should talk about your work and think about it. And before you know it, your career as a writer is down a track that's not the one that represents your stories, your community, your ideas, your voice. And that's what we want to get in the way of. And that's where I couldn't be more confident that if you are mentored uh, by Tony Birch, by Alison Whitaker, by Michelle Lee, or by any of our uh, seven other extraordinary mentors, I just can't see how you would let yourself be pushed around by a publisher who wasn't the right person for you at the end of it. And that's a big part of what we want. I'd ask you to join me in thanking these six so much for joining us on stage. There are reams and reams of information about the next chapter and what it is and how it works. Entries are open for year two today. Um, it's important to say that it's not a scheme where the writers are involved with the Wheeler Centre and with us for just one year. The first year is where there's the formal mentor relationship, but they are with us for life. They're stuck with us. And what we're keen to do is work with these writers uh, indefinitely to do all the things the Wheeler Centre does and work with publishers and work with uh, at some point with booksellers and find ways to get their works in the hands of the readers who need to read it. We are super excited by the possibility of introducing audiences at writers festivals around this country to the next generation of their favourite writers and I'm confident we've got 10 of them already uh, working away at what they're doing. We're going to have 10 more later this year uh, that does make me feel tired when I say that out loud, but it couldn't be more exciting. If you think you've got a book in you, if you know someone who you think has a book in them that, but not the confidence to advocate for themselves, you can nominate other people for this. We want people who are terrified of self-identifying as writers and need that push to get to the next bit. It's national. Uh, there's a lengthy period that you can apply in. Uh, there are some flyers around here that you can have a look at or go to the Wheeler Centre website and follow the links to the next chapter. Thank you and have a good festival. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.